Well, hey guys, good morning. It's uh, a sunny. It's not as warm as I'd like. It's in the uh, 60s. Gonna take a tour of the oceanfront, the resort strip at Virginia Beach. But the first place I'm gonna take you is just before we get across the bridge and go into the resort area, this little neighborhood back here. You might recognize it if you followed the Asphalt Odyssey series. It was the launching point and the return home point uh, when I shot the opening and the closing. This is the only place I can find on the oceanfront where I can park the spider with a view of the water in the background and not have any problems with uh, parking and zoning regulations. This is uh, Rudy Inlet right there. Uh, it was a creek originally, modified to become a significant inlet for boating traffic. And it's separated by the uh, Or it's connected by the bridge there, the Rudy Bridge. Eventually, it, it originally was a, uh, a swamp. <laughs> a little creek going out to the ocean. So that's where I shot the opening and the closing to the Asphalt Odyssey. So a couple other things we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about some trip tips, travel tips. And this is uh, in response to a uh, message I got from one of our viewers who asked a several very insightful questions about prepping for a long distance trip and some of the problems he's run into and I thought I would address those while we give uh, the nickel tour of the uh, of the resort area if it were also I'm pointed out before right here right here is the start of US Route 60 it, uh, there's a sign on the other side that says at the end but nothing designates it as the beginning I don't know why it's pretty historic it takes you pretty much all the way across the country. It used to go to the California coast, from the Atlantic coast to the California coast, but um, they've changed that, modified it with highways, so it currently goes to the California state line. And curiously enough, on the Asphalt Odyssey, we actually traveled on a bit of US 60 in New Mexico, uh, uh, Texas and New Mexico. All right, we're on Pacific Avenue now. We're gonna make a right turn onto Fifth Street which goes over to Atlantic Avenue, which is the uh, the resort strip. A bit of useless trivia here about the resort strip. The city itself is uh, almost 500 square miles. Half of it is uh, still rural farmland, woods, and the other half is developed. We are typical urban sprawl, shopping centers, subdivisions, uh, that, that sort of thing. But the resort strip, is uh, relatively small in comparison about four blocks deep and goes up to about uh, I think about 45th Street thereabouts and things begin to wind down but we'll show you that a lot of hotels lots of restaurants lots of things to do if you want to come here in the summertime what's really strange uh, during the peak season we don't come down here uh, the crowds are really crazy so we we generally don't come down here. It's really changed a lot since I was a young child growing up here. Uh, a lot for the better and some for the worse. Uh, one of the interesting things is all the high-rise hotels are uh, on the Atlantic Avenue, on the Atlantic side of Atlantic Avenue. And in the afternoon, it blocks the sun. Uh, so you get shade on the beach. Uh, a lot of other cities on the coast, they, uh, they have a buffer. And they build their hotels uh, a little further west so they don't cast a shadow that easily on the, on the, on the beach. Anyway, we're in New City. Oh, it looks like they're tearing down that, uh, that hotel. Probably to build a new hotel. Anyway, um, we're in New City. Although we, the town of Virginia Beach was formed in the early 1900s, I think it was about 1904, uh, it merged with the county of Princess Anne County in the early 60s and became the city of Virginia Beach. But we're only known primarily for the resort strip. It's still March, weather's still kind of chilly, spring is slowly uh, coming. It is sunny. It's a, 
So there isn't a whole lot going on here. Most of the shops are still closed. They typically they won't open until uh, probably May or early June when the tourists uh, start their influx, typically when school gets out. Now a lot of places that, uh, you know, Miriam and I are simply not interested in coming down to. It's, it, there are tourist traps. Uh, you know, uh, most of the stuff on Atlantic Avenue, uh, the restaurants and the shops are that way. There's a couple of exceptions, and I'll point those out. Curious uh, bit of useless trivia here. My grandfather, my mother's father from the western part of the state, uh, had never been to the ocean until he was uh, uh, pretty old. Uh, I was already born, I don't remember this, but uh, I was already around. My grandfather and my parents came down to look at the ocean. My grandfather looked out upon the ocean and with wonder and amazement he said, my gosh, I can't see the other side. He had never laid his eyes on an ocean before. He had no concept of how big an ocean can be. Hotels down here can be expensive in the summertime. Um, we stayed at one a couple years ago. Mary even treated me for my uh, my birthday. We took in one of the uh, high-end resorts uh, in the off-season, which made it uh, affordable because nobody else was there. And the room rates for that hotel in the peak season are $700 a night plus. Uh, no way in the world we'd ever pay that kind of money for uh, a hotel room. $700. You figure three nights. Good gracious, that's a good trip. A good trip on the spider somewhere. Okay, some personal favorites from uh, Miriam and myself. Restaurant right here uh, on the right hand side called Catch 31. Very good. Very good restaurant. Uh, of course, it's, it's in the Hilton. You would expect the Hilton to have a good restaurant. Uh, not cheap, but uh, you know, for a special occasion. We have a lot of live entertainment uh, on the beach, sponsored by the city in the summertime. This is one of the venues off to the right, Neptune Park. There with King Neptune in the background. What we are doing is cruising. We are cruising up Atlantic Avenue, which is a very popular thing to do in the summertime for a lot of younger folks up and down, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, the city realized that it caused a significant traffic congestion issue. And they have done everything they can to try to minimize that, even try to outline cruising. They actually had a group of guys that would monitor how many times you go up and down the street by noting your license plate number. And I don't know what the re, uh, what the limitation were. It was so many times in a set period of time, and if you did that, you were in violation. Heaven forbid you should get lost. You can't find your hotel room, and you go back and forth a couple of times, and you get a ticket for cruising. Not to help. I'm sorry. Right in front of us is the uh, the old Cavalier Hotel. It has recently been renovated. Uh, Miriam and I went over there and did uh, uh, a distillery tour. They have a distillery over there. They're making uh, bourbon. Uh, took us a uh, tour and took a sample. It was it was fairly good. We haven't we bought a bottle, haven't broken it open yet to uh, see what it tastes like beyond the first taste. Cause that's the real test of a bourbon. I realized that I we bought some bourbon one time after a tasting, and uh, I realized that it was it wasn't very good. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully this we bought a small bottle just because we didn't want to take that chance again. Uh, interesting uh, historical note. The founder of Coors Brewery, out off Coors, left that hotel, was staying at the hotel, and left the building via the sixth floor window, uh, and died, of course. Uh, it was ruled a suicide, but there are those who, they question that, and they say it was murder, but it was just before, as Prohibition was getting started, and he was winding down his, uh, his career, so. Don't know, I wasn't there, but that was about 1906. No, 1926, something like that. It's, it's in the... You can Google it. The founder of Coors Brewery dies in Virginia Beach. So we're back on Pacific Avenue, which is also Route 60, heading southbound. We're at 36th Street. 
There's a lot of shops and restaurants on this street also, just it's, it's uh, not as heavily traveled, so. The speed limit's a little higher. And I want to point out some of the uh, restaurants that we like to go to, some of the sites here. The first one is going to be here on 32nd Street. It's going to be a few blocks off the ocean. Smart Mouth Brewery uh, just moved into this new location. That's an old post office. Uh, a lot of microbreweries here in the city. They, they make a pretty good beer brew. Okay, at uh, 32nd Street and Holly Road, there's a little strip shop. You can see a right, strip mall over there to the left. And uh, tucked away in the corner over there is a little restaurant called Terrapin. Terrapin is, um, I don't want to call it fine dining. Uh, we really don't have quote unquote fine dining with white tablecloths and dress codes uh, at the, in the Virginia Beach. Um, I kind of wish we did, but we don't. It's, it's a tourist area. It's a beachy tourist area. So uh, I do know if you dress really, really poorly, they, we, uh, they may tell you they don't have any tables available. Uh, Miriam had a uh, out-of-town consultant come into town, and rec she recommended the restaurant to him. And they tried to turn him away because he walked in there with a hoodie. But once they they did s finally seat him. Anyway, Terrapin. Um, the chef Rodney is the owner and the lead head chef. Very good food. Give you an example. Uh, Miriam took me there for my birthday a few years ago, and they mixed my martini at the table and asked me if the juniper berries have been brewed sufficiently for my taste while shaking it. And I said, yes, sir, that'll be fine. Thank you. So. so on to a couple of questions that were asked by one of our viewers uh, in preparation for his trip. He is considering a, a really long trip. Uh, well, he's relatively new to uh, spider riding. He's a little older than us. I think he said he was 77. And uh, one of his first questions was uh, about extended warranties. What are my thoughts on extended warranties on the Spider? Uh, I have mixed feelings about extended warranties across the board to include the Spider's extended warranty. Uh, let me rephrase that. The equation is simple. They charge you more for the extended warranty than they expect to pay out. Uh, that's how the equation works and that's how they make a profit. Uh, that's what's true with all insurance, whether you have car insurance, life insurance, health insurance, that's all insurance. So. It's a mathematical poor gamble. You're betting against yourself. But you have to decide if it's something you want to take a chance of. It's like, you know, well, you know, we all probably have or need life insurance, uh, health insurance, that sort of thing, and car insurance for the unforeseen events. My personal thought about the Spider is it's a pretty reliable machine. Things that are going to fail are probably going to be tires, brakes, uh, the drive belt. And I don't even know if those are even covered in an extended warranty. Uh, your computer could go out on you. That's the, one of the big ticket items that has a, uh, I call it a weak link, especially if you have aftermarket electronics uh, plugged into your uh, system because of the CAN bus system. Uh, refer to the Schmokes blog uh, about uh, the CAN bus computer. He's, uh, he has his own channel and he rants about people plugging in aftermarket electronics into the Spider's system. Uh, for that very reason. Uh, so the likelihood of being stranded on the roof or mechanical thing that's covered by uh, an extended warranty is rare. Uh, but that's a decision you got to make about the, the warranty. Uh, and along that, maintenance you're liable to run into while you're on a trip. You're probably run, gonna run, you could run into uh, a belt issue, a dry belt issue. Uh, Gosh, you really can't carry necessarily a spare belt. If you do carry a spare belt, you probably will not have the tools to uh, to change it, to install it. Uh, it's pretty labor intensive, so uh, I would let let a shop do that. But things that can leave you stranded besides that are like flat tires. That's why I carry not only a can of fix a flat, I also carry a tire plug kit, which I have trained myself on how to use. I also carry a small air compressor, uh, very small, that plugs into the Spider's power supply. Caution note, although it comes with a cigarette lighter plug for power, 
if you plug it into the spider's 12 volt power supply, which is the cigarette lighter in the trunk area, uh, it will pop the circuit, pop the fuse, uh, because it's not designed for that much power load. I have adapted mine to plug straight into the battery power supply, so it comes right off the battery, and you can uh, power the compressor. It's very small, very tiny, very compact. Picked it up on Amazon, and I'll put the the link, or the not the link, but the, the name, the brand name of the uh, compressor, uh, in the comments. Now something else I do have, my insurance company offers me uh, the option to have roadside assistance and towing. Uh, now roadside assistance is not going to be able to show up and change your tire if you have a flat on a spider because they probably have no idea how to change a tire on a spider. But the coverage I have, it is, uh, I can get free towing to the nearest facility that is certified to work on the spider. Uh, I think the it runs me about three dollars extra a month. So a little peace of mind if you're out and about in the middle of nowhere and you have a mechanical problem. Um, all you got to do is call your insurance company or call your whoever your roadside assistance plan is. They will figure out who to call and send them to you to rescue you. So uh, it's always good to know that uh, I have that option. The next question was. GPS on the spider. Um, the, uh, the, you know, I have the GPS that came with the spider because it's the uh, limited edition, and it has it. Some of the spiders do, some of the spiders do not. Uh, it depends on your model, and sometimes it's a little tricky to get the aftermarket equipment to actually put the stock or the standard uh, GPS and it powers into the spider's power system, uh, power supply. Uh, and the question was, can I use a, a cell phone, a uh, smartphone GPS for, uh, for navigation? Absolutely you can, absolutely. Uh, you'll notice I have my phone mounted on a RAM mount right here, primarily so I can listen to music. Uh, I have uh, the streaming, uh, serious uh, satellite streaming. Of course, it takes a cell phone link to get to, to pull down the satellite, just like the GPS. You actually have to have oops, uh, just a camera, camera there. You actually have to uh, have cell phone signal for your GPS to work on your smartphone. Uh, it's, that's my understanding. I don't think I've ever been in a situation where I needed my GPS on my smartphone and didn't have the GPS signal. Um, but then again, I am old school. I learned how to navigate with wristwatch, map, and compass. Uh, I can't imagine going on a road trip without having paper maps. Uh, in any of it, uh, we have a technical malfunction with any of my technology, I can still navigate. And you know, we're making a right turn here on Winston-Salem, which is the road that uh, goes by Rudy Inlet. This is the marina area. And places to eat. Breakfast and lunch, I have a favorite called Big Sam's right there. A little hole in the wall place. Been there forever today. Uh, if you're lucky, you can get a table that sets out over the water and uh, look at the activity in the marina. Have yourself a breakfast, a Bloody Mary if you're predisposed to do that. Good food, reasonable prices. Uh, in the summertime, it's crowded. So, in summary to the question about the GPS, yes, your cell phone GPS will work. Just get a RAM mount. I've got a video on how I mounted my RAM mount to the uh, handlebar. It was a little bit of a little bit of a chore. Okay, other restaurants, Rockefellers, really, really good food, reasonably priced. Uh, I've been there several times. Uh, if you're lucky, you get a view of the marina from your table. Another place, Rudy's. They've got the tables covered because it's the off season. But you can set out on the marina and watch the uh, watch the activity in the harbor while you have your your breakfast buffet and actually they call it Saturday brunch. And also they have really good food inside the uh, restaurant. Okay, we're back to Fifth Street where we made our first turn off the oceanfront after coming in off of the Rudy Bridge. And the start of you was 60. You know some other thoughts about. Um, trip preparations. 
Um, things that you could never expect to happen will go wrong. That's just the nature of life. So roll with the punches. Uh, accept that it's going to happen. And, you know, the things that, uh, you know, you always have to worry about the thought of mechanical breakdown. And that's one. And there's also the possibility of getting sick. And uh, uh, I've done that on a couple of trips. Uh, the last one, I think, was the one that impacted my trip the most. Well, there was a time I fell and broke my back. <laughs> that's another story. Uh, well, guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this video and take it on into the barn. It's 1 o'clock now after the time change. I'm still getting used to that. So it's, uh, it's lunchtime. I have to coordinate some lunch and probably get something, of, something else done, get some work done. But I appreciate you guys tagging along. Hope you enjoyed the, uh, the guided tour of the resort strip, which is our hometown. And hope that uh, shed some light on some of the travel related topics that we discussed. And so, well, until next time, guys, we will catch you all later. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, give it a thumbs down. And don't forget to subscribe. Feel free to leave a comment below.